Hello and welcome to another edition of the Cyclone Insider Podcast and live stream. Stream. I am Travis Hines. He is Randy Peterson coming to you on Thursday afternoon of Championship Week where Iowa State will learn its bowl destination come Sunday. The Iowa State men play tomorrow, Friday at DePaul in Chicago. Lots going on. We talked a lot about the bowl, Randy, for the radio show on Monday. And I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem the thinking has changed much that we're probably going to be waiting on a lot of the results from Saturday and see how the college football playoff situation shakes out and on down the line we'll go. Yeah, I talked to David Fletcher from the um, um, Texas Bowl. I don't know what day this is. I talked to him Tuesday, I think. Um, yeah, and, they, and obviously they like Iowa State. I mean, they're not going to say they don't. It's um, they, they, If Iowa State's on the board, I got the idea. I got the impression that they, that they would take them. But um, I guess it also depends on who else is available. All, it's it's all going to depend on who, on on what would that be? I guess on Saturday, on on this weekend, on this weekend, if Texas beats, if te- if Texas beats Oklahoma State, then Texas is is um, is going to a New Year's Six Bowl. Where what's screwy is is that Texas was what six seven something seven. like that seven. In the in the college football playoffs, so a couple of things have to happen for Texas to get into um, the college football playoffs, which is interesting because Texas had maybe the the best victory of the season um, at at Alabama in the season opener, but uh, um, so I get that that's that's pretty much what the Big Twelve bowls are contingent upon, but but it's Houston or um, or Memphis, and Iowa State's been to both of them. Iowa State was in Houston, though, in 2005, 2006, something like that. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, – Iowa State's going somewhere, and they'll find out. Um, I, I Maybe – I don't know. It depends on – a lot, lot's going to depend on, on what happens this weekend. <laughs> yeah, I think we've probably talked about it in circles now where – everybody knows the situation and how it shakes out will ultimately depend a lot on not only what happens in Arlington and AT&T stadium on Saturday, but elsewhere across the country where we have maybe the most muddled or chaotic field for the college football playoffs since it moved to four teams uh, with so many teams with very strong resumes where it's not here are your four. And if everything holds steady, it's pretty cut and dry where I think we're going to have a lot of, uh, be a lot of issues, I think, on Sunday. As, huge uh, issues. The committee huge tries issues. to work through yes. that. Yeah, huge issues if Texas does not get in. Yeah, I that's 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 true. And if Texas wins and does not get in, yeah, that that's gonna be that's gonna be um it's gonna be interesting to see the fallout from that. That's one why they did, that's why they have a 12 team playoff next year. One thing we did not talk about much on the radio yeah. show on Monday, if at all, was uh, the men's basketball team's three-game trip in Orlando, going one and two, beating VCU but losing to Virginia Tech and Texas A&M. Uh, Randy and I were not at any of the three games. We were at the K-State game uh, on Saturday, but now I've had a chance to, to dive back into hoops, got a chance to talk to TJ Otzelberger and a couple players yesterday. Uh, Randy, my general thoughts on those three games is – Certainly a lot of flaws and issues got exposed. Um, and I think it probably taps the break on how advanced offensively and maybe overall people thought this team might be after their four, four first games against poor competition, I think. But ultimately some growing pains and maybe a slower ramp up towards a ceiling should have been expected for this young, inexperienced, and new with transfers group that I'm not, I think obviously if you're an Iowa state fan or if you're TJ Otzelberger, you, you would have hoped they would have played better certainly in some key positions and key spots and games over the weekend. But I didn't see anything that I felt was a huge red flag about how this team's going to be able to compete in the big 12 or, or make an NCAA tournament. Certainly things they have to fix and clean up between now and then. Uh, but I think mostly I, my uh, concern level is hovering from low to medium right now. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I kind of thought they'd win two games. Um, in Florida, but be that as it may, what were they up 20 in one game, 15, 15 or so in one game, 20, I don't know what it was. And they, and they can't, and they lost. So they, yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't finish. Um, the shooting was, was like you said, I, I, I don't know whether, whether they're shooting. I think Iowa State shooting is percentage is somewhere between what they shot in Florida and what we, we've seen them, um, shoot in the, in the previous four games. And um, what I was kind of interested in was watching Taman and Keyshawn Gilbert. They, I don't know whether, and, and like, like you said, neither one of us were there, but my inclination, my initial thinking when watching one of those games, I don't know. I don't remember which one was that both of them were, were trying to, to do too much. We're trying to do too much in the lane. Now, maybe that's, that's the deal. I know they try to get to the free throw line. I know that, but um, they certainly weren't making free throws. So that was a little bit exposed. Um, I'm, I was happy to see Milan snap out of, he had one, he had a bad shooting game. I was glad to see Milan finish, finish somewhat strong. Um, there in a, in a, in a high note. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, there's, there's no, there's no red flags there. Nobody expected him to go through the non-conference unbeaten. Um, they can get back on the winning track tomorrow night at DePaul where you, you will be headed at some point shortly. And um, you know, we'll see, we'll see where it goes from there. But, but uh, now, if they if they should happen to 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 not play well at DePaul, I think there's all kinds of red flags that can go up. Um, yeah, because, DePaul is terrible. I guess yeah, it's yeah. Even, it's probably not even worth talking about that game. No, no, I agree. Because, no, know, but, but what it would mean five or whatever with three home losses to mid majors and below. Right, but what it would mean going forward for Thursday night for a Cyhawk game on Thursday night. Um, that's that's what I mean. Iowa State needs to get some get some momentum and and get some get some um, positive positive juju going up, going in for that game. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of Orlando, the, the couple of things that I think they're going to have to figure out and solve are, it, it seemed like with the competition level increasing, the size and physicality increasing, they did not adapt to that well, which, again, maybe not surprising given the amount of newcomers and given, I'm guessing there was a, a false – or inflated sense of achievement for how well they scored the ball and how much they dominated in those four, first four games because they won by an average of 45 points a game, where you go up against VCU, Tech, and a and like, those are just vastly different types of athletes and basketball players to where the what, what was successful before ain't going to fly in a lot of those situations. The thing – and I think ultimately they'll adjust to that to one degree or another. The things that, I, that I'm keeping an eye on – are Gilbert and Lipsy, I thought, struggled a little bit to finish around the rim against that size and athleticism. Can they they sort through that, adapt through that? The shooting, given what we've seen the last two years, has got to be a concern. You know, Curtis Jones is struggling mightily from three-point line, and he's a guy that has a track record of success. So part of you wants to say he's in a slump and he'll figure it out. But the other part of you says, you know, 40 plus three point attempts is it's not a great sample size, but it's a decent one to where you're going to want to see that reverting back to his average here pretty soon. Or the you're going to be concerned about what he can bring you on that end. And I think, again, he's not dissimilar from Gabe Kalsher in the fact that whatever the issues may be offensively, he gives you a lot defensively. I thought he was I don't know if he was their best on ball defender in Orlando, but certainly was the most aggressive and disruptive on ball defender that they had. And I think that counts for a lot. And the other thing is just, it wasn't just that the offense struggled that we, we saw them, you know, hit that brick wall. We saw them, we have seen them hit over the last two years where it just becomes so bogged down and so difficult for them to score. And I think part of the issue is the shooting, obviously the, the lack of being able to make free throws is huge. But I wonder what the skill level is for this team is in terms of passing. And I think Milan Mamchilovic is their most talented offensive player. And we haven't seen enough against high-level competition for me to have an opinion one way or another about this. 
but the question I'm asking is, can you run offense through him more? I don't know because is he a great passer? Can he create for himself and can, can he create for others? That's asking a lot from a true freshman who has not played a lot and whose skill set is really built around getting buckets and shooting the ball from three. And, you know, does that adapt to those other things? You know, it's not necessarily a George Niang situation where that dude, you got him the ball in the, the post or the high post or in the short corner or whatever, where you knew he was going to create, it wasn't going to be fast, but it was going to be pretty. And he had the vision and the ability to pass the ball and create for others where he could be that focal point where everything uh, went around him. I don't know that Milan Mancilovic is that type of player. Maybe he is. We'll see. Because I think ultimately, like, that would be how you would want to utilize him because he is such a talented scorer, because he is such a talented shooter, that can he be the that focal point, that fulcrum that everything spins around and tilts off of. Time will tell. And, again, that's asking a ton from a true freshman. And he can draw the be a fair ask. And he can draw if if in fact he is, he can draw the double team. Um, and then but if you're drawing a double team, then you darn sure better have somebody that can shoot it. Um, yeah. I, and if they're going to do if they're gonna go that route, they darn sure better better do it here in the next couple of weeks because because the schedule's not not lightening up any. I mean, the Big 12 conference starts January 4th, third, fourth, something like that. Well, they basically go back to the the also Rams after that Iowa game, where you you get Iowa on December exactly. 7th, that's what I mean. Yes, nothing yeah, basically Iowa until then, January six. Yeah, Iowa and then the bye games. Yes, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. You better, you darn sure better, um, better do it in those in those games. Um, yeah, I, I would. What I wouldn't be surprised if they did something like that. They, I mean, right now the, he's their he's their best player. What do you, Travis? What do you think? What do you make of of Omaha Baloo? Now he showed. Some flashes, not many, a, a few in um, in in at Disney in 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 Florida. Um, I kind of like what he like him a little bit around the basket. I mean, he showed he played well around the basket at times. What do you what do you make of him? Is it just a freshman um, who may have been? I don't know what's a, what's the right word. Who people may have expected too much from because a lot of people got to see him play. Um, right at home there in, in, in Waukee. What do, you, what do you think about him, Trap? Yeah, I mean, certainly you have a McDonald's All-American and a five-star. You're going to have – you're expecting an immediate impact, and certainly Omaha Baloo is not giving that to Iowa State right now. And I don't think Otzelberger and his staff were ne necessarily expecting right. that right away. I mean, I think you've seen glimpses and you've seen strides of what he can do. But, I mean, like the, to me, like – the bigger issue, you know, he's his rebounding rates are pretty mediocre at, you know, 10% on offensive rebounds, 11% on defensive rebounds. Like that's where you want to see him make a difference. You know, the the block shot rate is basically non-existent for him uh, so far early this year that you're not seeing the impact that you would expect or hope, I think, from a, a guy of his – pedigree in terms of uh, recruiting rankings, but I think the thing to remember is the position and the type of player he is. It's not like you're getting a guy that is ready-made for the NBA, ready-made for the Big 12. Like There is some development that has to occur here, and I think the important part for Omaha is to stay the course and let the game slow down, and the, really the only way that happens is by sticking with it, staying on the floor. Uh, and he's in a tough spot where Iowa State probably can't let him work out every kink on the floor. That if he's not able, you know, if he makes a mistake or two or three, they probably need to move on to the next player because they got to win a lot of, the, you know, they got to win these games to make the NCAA tournament and they have capable big men, you know, especially with Hassan Ward out, you'd hope to see a little bit more from Omaha. But I am very much of the, the thinking of you got to be patient with freshmen that like sometimes they've got it and you've got a guy like Tyrese Halliburton that, you know, breaks the assist record in November or December, you know, whatever it is when he broke half's record with 17 assists. Um, and then there's times where again, like George Niang didn't start until January. Monte Morris didn't start until February. I yeah. want to say 
Yeah. Um, when he replaced Matt Thomas in the lineup. So again, like a more scrutiny and probably a tougher position and type of game to immediately translate where a lot of it is dictated on your physical gifts that when you're at Waukee high school, those physical gifts are overwhelming to your competition. Where at this level, even if they're better, they're not going to counteract skill, uh, experience, and everything that come, that you get at this level to where it's just going to take some time. So again, I'm not I'm not super worried, but I'm I'm viewing it from a Iowa State getting contributions from him, not necessarily a, an NBA draft type profile because I think those are two different things. Yeah, and and one other one other note about about the about Florida Jackson Pebble Pev, Pevala, Pevales, Pevales, anyway. Jackson Pavelski. 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 Why can't I say that? Um, yeah, I, I, he played more than I than I thought he would, and I think TJ's gradually working him to get some more minutes. You know, as a as an on ball guy, um, you know, kind of a um, to change the tempo, maybe a little bit, add some spark off off the bench. So that was a positive coming out of out of that tournament. I mean, sure, it was Iowa State lost two games, but but there there were some. There were some positives that came out of there, um, and that's why they that's why they play those tournaments. So I was, I it was, um, um, yeah, I was I, Iowa State fans should be pleased that 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 he that he's starting to 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 get more action. Um, six two hundred eighty five pound guard out of out of Wisconsin. Um, yeah, I, I was I was happy that 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 they were able to um, to get him in there. Um, um, and Taman's Taman. I mean, he's he's a triple double waiting to happen. I think, and, and I'm guessing he, I'm not guessing, but he could have it before before they start the the Big Twelve. Um, he he really is. He's 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 tenacious. He's a fighter on the boards. He's tenacious. He's not backing down from anybody. He's playing with a confidence that I've not seen him play with or not, um, right now. Um, he's he's we've seen him him assist, and he's also you know, one of the two or three scorers that this team has. So his, he's, he's playing very at a very high level right now also. So if they get some of these other guys going, um, yeah, I think, I think that's what these remaining um, non-conference games are, are, are going to determine whether if they, if they can get those guys going, then boom, you're right into, into the big 12. And at, I believe it's at, at Oklahoma and Oklahoma is better than, than I anticipated they would be. So it would be, so um, but I'm, I'm like you, I'm not, I don't think there's any reason to, to red flag anything at the, at this point in time. I think this was everything that's happened so far is, is fairly anticipated. He's Randy Peterson. I'm Travis Hines. This has been the Cyclone Insider podcast and live stream. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you missed anything, be sure to check it out, uh, either on the YouTube channel or wherever it is you get the podcast. Thanks for listening.